Yo, 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 yo. Hey, everyone. Anthony Fantano here, Internet's busiest music nerd. Hope you're doing well. And we are going to be listening to a new episode of the Needle Drop podcast here. Thank you for tuning in. And in this episode, we have Maddox on the show, a longtime internet and culture commentator, provocateur. We talk about his website, his YouTube series, his passionate, angry rants on various topics, his podcast, and his new book, which he has coming out soon. And uh, yeah, that's essentially the conversation there. Now, if you want to support this podcast, you can do so in a myriad of ways. You're already doing one by watching it on the YouTube channel. You could share it, like it, comment. You could also hit up our iTunes link where we backlog older episodes. We archive episodes of this podcast on iTunes. Now, if you want to be up to date with the podcast for a small monthly fee, we will just send them straight into your email inbox whenever we come out with a new episode. And uh, you can also use our Amazon Associates link. Anything you buy on Amazon, if you live in the U.S., we get kicked back from it, and it doesn't add to your overall price. Just use it to buy stuff you were going to buy anyway. All it costs is an extra click. And uh, that's it. Cool? So just have fun listening to the episode. You're the best forever. Hey everyone, Anthony Fantano here, Internet's Busiest Music Nerd, you know who it is, and you're listening to another episode of the Needle Drop Podcast, where we invite content creators and artists from around the web to come talk about what they do, and in this episode, my guest has been an active culture commentator and provocateur since the late 90s. He runs the best page in the universe, which eventually developed into the best show in the universe on YouTube. He also runs the podcast Biggest Problem in the Universe, which also features an ongoing list of the biggest problems in the universe. And he is a published author as well with a new book on the way. Of course, you can find more info on that through the best mailing list in the universe. Welcome to the show, Maddox. Yeah, man, that's quite the intro. You nailed it. You hit all the all the talking points. You nailed it, every single one. Thanks for having me. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, so, so as I was saying before I turned this recorder on, this has been sort of a... a a weird cross section of of paths here because I've been reading your website since high school and uh, uh, sort of going back on your website now and looking through a lot of those old archives. Uh, it, it was pretty funny seeing you um, rant about stuff that just has a totally different context now. Like I reread your Jared Fogel <laughs> <laughs> article, which. In in retrospect, now it's like it's that's that's so great. If only you just had the <laughs> the premonition, just throw child molester in there casually. You know, it just it just would have made sense. You would have predicted it. Yeah, man. Uh, so a long time ago, I wrote this article called "How to Spot a Pedophile," and I talked about this phenomenon that I felt that a lot of pedophiles had after you know I, after seeing their pictures and mugshots appear in the news. I noticed some 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 patterns, and they all had kind of this distinct type of smile that I called the pedo smile. And it was a slight, it was almost like a Mona Lisa smile. Like if, if the Mona Lisa were a dude, you know, imagine that smile on a dude and that's a pedophile. That was my theory anyway. So I wrote that article, you know, kind of a satirical article, like can we spot pedophiles based on their smile? And then um, about four or five years later, there's this science journal that published this article that is actually giving credence to this theory. They're saying that there may actually be some truth to this. And I was cited in some, like, some scientific article some, uh, on a website somewhere. You actually got credit? Oh, yeah, yeah. They linked to it. And they, they, they begrudgingly linked to me, too. They said, well, you know, this guy's language is very colorful and uh, we don't agree with all of his conclusions, but here is the article anyway. <laughs> um. You know, do, doing what you do, uh, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just really impressed with uh, uh, how negative of a following and just, uh, uh, just how unique your uh, your reputation is online. I mean, over the years, and you've been doing this for a while, you've you've made quite a few enemies, uh, enemies of of everybody from New Yorkers to Penn and Teller to the Apple Corporation to even uh, pepperoni lovers. Yeah. Pepperoni lovers who, uh, you know, for short, I just like to call them idiots. Hmm. Um, pepperoni is a garbage topping and a waste of time. Now, you know, 
I, I created this article about pepperoni a while back, and I know I'm going on a tangent here because you mentioned a bunch of other stuff, but I just it's fresh on my mind. Someone linked to me a YouTube video recently where a guy, I guess he was um, he was near near Italy, and he wanted to have a test to see if he could drive to Italy and buy a pizza in the time it took for his friend to make one from scratch. Mm. And uh, anyway, so, so he, he drove to Italy, and he asked for a pizza with pepperoni on it. Pepperoni does not mean pepperoni in Italian. Pepperoni means peppers. There is no such thing as pepperoni. Uh, so he ordered his pizza and brought it home and was disappointed to find out he just got a pizza full of peppers on it. Uh, so yeah, pepperoni is a garbage topping. It's stupid, and I will fight anyone on it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that is the thank perfect you, thank you for that. that rant. Um, thank you for that. <laughs> So, so <laughs> considering your your strong opinions on everything, very very strong negative opinions on everything, um, you know, I I mean, me me personally as as someone who critiques something, you know, I review music on a regular basis, and we're talking about like hundreds of album reviews coming out every year. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm astounded with just how many things you find to hate uh, in in the world, and it's 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 a talent to the point where usually things that uh, either I maybe like a little bit or maybe I'm kind of neutral on, you sort of bring this perspective where you bring out everything's uh, inherent shittiness. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, I like to I like to make the world a little grayer. Uh. You know, I, I think, uh, <laughs> you know, hey, thanks, man, was maybe not the response that I expected from that. <laughs> but obviously you sort of seem to take pride in it. Yeah, well, I mean, here's the thing. If I If I hate something... There, and enough to the point where I'm going to take time out of my life to write an article on a website and then also create a video and do all the research. Like, it's really got to invoke some strong feelings. But I can also say the same of things that I love. Like, for example, Mad Max. The new Mad Max movie was so awesome. It's king shit, right? It should be picture of the year of 2015 of 2016 and 2017. I'm going to go out on the record and I'm going to say that the Academy Award is going to go to Mad Max for all three years. And it's such a good movie. I, I rated that movie out of five stars. I gave it 100 stars. 100 mm. out of five stars. I loved it. So I, I look, I'm a passionate man. What can I say? I love things and I hate things to the max. To the max. <laughs> <laughs> it it makes me sort of uh, want to ask you to what do you, what do you feel is sort of the uh, importance of negativity online or just negativity in general because the internet generally sort of seems to be this place where uh, we see things as really negative. There's negative comments. There's trolls. There's haters. There's a lot of vitriol getting thrown around everywhere, and it seems like people who own websites where comments and interactions can be. Uh, posted do their best to kind of clean the negativity up get rid of it throw it in the trash and you just sort of seem to put it out there and uh, uh, not hold back on any of it maybe you kind of just go a little over the top with it I mean you know you you're obviously much more personable in this conversation than I think a lot of people would probably assume you were looking uh, <laughs> just looking at your videos right um, so there let's to get real for here for a second I, I read this uh, there's this book that um uh, that I read a while back called You Are Not So Smart. And he does a podcast as well. And he talked about this guy recently on his podcast. His name is Paul Graham. Have you heard of Paul Graham before? Enlighten me. Uh, Paul Graham is, um, he's, a, he, he's big in the tech world. And he wrote an essay, I think back in 2008, called How to Disagree. And he talked about this phenomenon of of disagreement on the internet and the reason there's so much of it and there's so much negativity it's because liking something or agreeing with someone is something you can do passively when you like something or someone you don't even have to comment especially if you read a news article however if you dislike or disagree with someone you have to voice your opinion and you have to post something so more often than not, when someone comments on a website, just by virtue of the fact that they're commenting, it's going to be more negative than positive. And with the advent of Facebook and social networks, they have lowered the cost of liking or disagreeing, or excuse me, liking or agreeing with someone to simply clicking a like button. So that, that is why sometimes when you glance at Facebook or the YouTube comments section, um, you, will be, you will come away with the overwhelming feeling that everybody hates everything out there and it's all very negative. And that just isn't the case. 
the people who are likely to comment aren't re necessarily representative of the majority of people who are viewing your content or news article. So basically when people like something or they're fine with something, <laughs> they're more likely to uh, respond with just silence and then Correct. just watching it and then walking away, whereas hate sort of inspires something in people. Yeah, exactly. But look, I mean, just look at the comments section of a YouTube video of where the majority of the upvotes, excuse me, the majority of the, the votes on the video is, is thumbs up as opposed to thumbs down, and then read the comments and see if the comments correspond to those votes. You More often than not, they don't, because people who are very, uh, if you like something, if you like a YouTube video, you're less likely to comment saying, hey, I really like this video, because otherwise you're going to see, you know, hundreds and thousands of people commenting the exact same thing, saying, I like this, I think this is great, good job, keep it going. You're going to see less positive reinforcement and more negative, because negative Behind the negativity is usually a reason. If they hmm. didn't like something you said, they're going to say specifically what they didn't like about it and why they disagree. Whereas if they liked it, well, what do you need to know? We liked it. Got it. Yeah. This, this sort of makes me think about uh, the internet age and new media versus old media because, I mean, you, you and I are obviously uh, at an age where we can remember we're not going on the internet most of the time to expose ourselves to news and entertainment and so on and so forth. And a vast majority of the entertainment that we were seeing on TV or in the radio or in newspapers, I mean, all of those sources were very carefully compiled and created so that they wouldn't elicit hatred from the audience. You know, I mean, if, if people hated what they were being exposed to on a certain TV station or in a book or what have you, uh, that meant loss of sales or some kind of drama, you know, the bottom line would be affected. And now in the internet age, it seems like uh, there's been this rise of content that people just love to hate watch. Hate watching right. is very much a thing. And now that people can really just kind of uh, indulge in that side of themselves, I mean, there are people online who, you know, essentially make livings, even on places like YouTube, uh, making videos where they know they're just kind of effectively trolling their audiences and uh, just eliciting negative responses. Yeah, I've seen some of that. I've seen some people who are intentionally trolling. But so let me ask you this, like, in, because as a music and culture critic yourself, um, do you ever look to hate review an album? Like, do you know going into an album that you're not going to like it or a certain band and you're going, you're kind of just doing it to take the piss out of it just because it's fun. You know, there, there are a handful of reviews where I know that I'm going to hate it. Sure. And then uh -huh. I end up hating it. And I know that, I know that as a result, my audience is going to go ape shit over it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> ape shit in a positive way or a negative way? Oh, in a negative way, you know, yeah. and, and sometimes, um, and sometimes I try to sidestep that. Uh, there was one time way back earlier in, uh, in my YouTube video series where people were just, and, and I remember I had posed this idea on Twitter and everybody just reacted negatively to it at first. Limp Biscuit was coming out with a new record. And then I said, Hey guys, new Limp Biscuit record just got announced. Do you want me to review it? Right. And I got all these responses that people, people were just saying, no, fuck you. Shut the fuck up, you moron. <laughs> and so then the album, it's like a week away from getting released. And then I just get inundated with all these comments saying, the new Limp Bizkit, you got to review it. You're going to hate the shit out of this thing. Right. And then I just decided to, instead of review it, um, I just ate food on camera for six minutes straight. I just uh, <laughs> instead of reviewing the album, instead of reviewing it, <laughs> I just sat there and ate food. The video actually got posted on BuzzFeed. I know you love that site. Oh, my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> big, big fan of BuzzFeed. Love all their content. They're doing great work. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, every, every once in a while I try to sidestep it. There was actually a, a review I had done last year of this particular rapper. His name is Big Sean. And uh, the album was I know titled... Big Sean, yeah. Yeah. The, the, uh, the song was titled... Dark, the record was titled Dark Sky Paradise. Okay. And um, Big Sean is a rapper I'm not really a big fan of. I don't think he's intolerable but what sort of irks me about him is that in in the world of hip-hop he seems like such a non-essential character like if hip-hop were a horror movie he would be the first to get killed off um <laughs> because he just he just really adds nothing to the cast of characters Anthony, come on what are you talking about have you heard his song ass 
<laughs> very deep, very deep track. <laughs> the first 10 words are ass. <laughs> That's it's true. So, oh, and, and, uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, they rhyme like he rhymed ten words in a row. What more do you want? <laughs> you know, the, there's there's even a track off of his latest record called uh, "What Is It?" I, I'm not fucking with you. Uh -huh. it's, he's just pretty much saying that phrase over and over again. Again, r really deep, important artist here. Significant yeah. contributions to the art form. Yeah. So uh, for about three or four minutes, I just said the word "no," you know, over and over and over and over. But kind of phrasing it in such a way where it sounded like I was saying sentences like "no, no, 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 no." No, 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 no. And then I would like have album covers kind of flipping back and forth, you know, behind me as if I was talking about the albums. And the review hit the top of Google. So if you Googled his name, like within a few hours, if you Googled his name, my review would be the first thing to pop up. People vandalized his Wikipedia page and just put the word no throughout the whole page wow. and, put, and put the word no throughout like the page of the album. And uh, it, it was it was pretty crazy for a little while. You just uh, you just could not escape my review if you were looking for anything related to Big Sean. That's and, great. Um, I love that. Oh, I love it, too. You know, it's if I'm going to hate something. It, which I know is, you know, it comes with the territory, you know, you're not going to like everything, but when no. I know I'm going to hate something, I figure you've really just got to go all in and just, just go completely off the wall and just kind of give people, you know, uh, not what they, uh, something that they didn't know they wanted, you know, just like give them a left hook. Right. Left hook, left hook, sucker punch. Bam. You didn't see that coming. Um, I love it when you take over. The, the Google results of somebody's, uh, like for example, when I had a similar instance when uh, Christopher Reeve uh, passed away, I wrote this article titled, Christopher Reeve is an asshole. And I wrote this before he passed away. And in this article, I talked about how he uh, didn't really give a shit about paralysis until after he became paralyzed. And after he became paralyzed, he raised a lot of money for the Paralysis Foundation, which is great. Um, it's definitely he's definitely helped people's paralysis, but again, he didn't care about it until afterwards. And then the amount of attention he gave to it um, exceeded the amount of people who were suffering from paralysis at some point. So I made this article, called him an asshole. Um, and then after he passed away, when you Googled Christopher Reeve's name on Google, it was the second search result. Uh, the first one was his paralysis foundation. The second one was mine. So I got a lot of hate mail. So many people came to my website cursing me out, uh, wishing I was dead. I got death threats, rape threats, you name it. And um, I even got a contact from the lawyer from the Christopher Reeve Foundation. And he told me to take the page down. And I wrote back to him and I, I said, look, man, uh, whether or not you agree with uh, what I'm saying here, all around the Internet, people are having a debate about the merits of what I I'm saying here. Essentially, I'm asking the question, should we care about an illness only after a celebrity becomes ill with it, or should we start looking more critically at people who need help, regardless of whether or not we suffer from that affliction? And he wrote back to me and he said, you know what, Maddox, we, we disagree with the way that you're, you're saying this message, but we agree that this is an important debate to have. So voluntarily, I decided to add a little disclaimer to people who are coming to my website from Google looking for Christopher Reeve, just letting them know that this is not the Christopher Reeve Foundation. And they were okay with that. They let it go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing that I, I, I have to give you is uh, beyond the cynicism of a lot of what you say, it seems like you're not really provoking people to, uh, to just further dive down into just selfishness and nihilism and so on and so forth. It's like you're kind of challenging some readers to actually care. I mean, one article that sort of comes to mind is your uh, SOPA and your PIPA article, um, where it's it's not like these issues aren't important. It's more like you guys aren't actually engaging with the problem here or getting involved. You're just kind of talking about it on Twitter and that's it. Correct. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a really good example of that. When SOPA became the internet's big cause, and pe I'm, I'm sure people listening today right now don't even remember this whole incident that happened, but there was this piece of legislation called SOPA. It was the Stop Online Piracy Act, I think is what, what it stood for. And it was a terribly written piece of legislation that, that uh, essentially gave far-reaching powers to corporations to essentially um, 
shut down free speech if they wanted to. They could shut down. They, it, it caused all sorts of problems online. So people got up in arms and they said, let's stop this bill from passing. Let's let's make sure this doesn't occur. But I think everyone missed the point of this bill and and uh, and how poorly it was written. The point is that the people who passed it are still elected. They still have their jobs and they're going to try again and again and again until they get some permutation of this bill passed, which is exactly what happens. The same jokers who passed this, who try to pass the SOPA bill, tried to pass another bill, and, se- and they've since been successful, several of them, because not every bill is going to be on everyone's radar all the time. We don't have enough time or energy or power to constantly black out the front page of Google and YouTube and all of our websites every time we disagree with a bill. We have to go to the root of the problem, which is get these jokers out of office. That's essentially what I was trying to say. Um, yeah. It's a, I don't know, it's kind of an interesting uh, position to sort of be in, or I guess uh, kind of a, a, a lack of change on that level, despite seeing so much fervor and so much anger and so much unrest uh, in the streets of some cities and especially on social media, people sort of seem generally very unhappy <laughs> with how the system is working, but continually uh, a lot of the same legislators and congressmen and women just continually get elected and reelected. Right. It's an, office, it's an awful cycle that will continue to go down this path so long as we allow it. Um, and and I remember a long time ago during a book tour, someone came up to me and said, hey, Maddox, I love your website. I love how much you hate things. And I I kind of pointed out to him that uh, it's not necessarily that I hate things. It's that I really care. I think that hating hating sometimes is um, is the biggest form of, of uh, love that there is because you really care and you really want to change things. So that's why I write these rants. That's why I write these articles. Um Ultimately, on some fundamental level, I do want there to be some positive change in the world. And I think that by drawing attention to these problems and asking people to actually do something rather than just retweet an article or retweet a position, get out there and do something, change something, make a difference, make it better. And by complaining about it, that's my ultimate goal. I think that my form of complaining is the biggest form of love that there is. So basically, underneath the hardened shell, you're just a big pussy. <laughs> Wrong. Incorrect. I was, <laughs> I was literally reaching for my keyboard to hit my buzzer button because I have a buzzer that I play on my <laughs> on my podcast. Um, no, no, absolutely not. I'm a hardened. I'm a hard. I'm. I have a. I have a cold, dead heart. But uh, I would like it to get better by making the world a better place. How about that? Yeah. Okay. I understand that. I understand that. <laughs> So after, you know, sort of exposing yourself here, sure, sure, there's yeah. there's caring beyond uh, the negativity and there's concern there. Um, but does that necessarily mean that you feel that uh, there's something to sort of look forward to uh, in the future? You know, are you hopeful uh, generally about what is coming tomorrow, especially in light of a... Uh, uh, the shit show that has been sort of the, uh, the 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 current election that's coming up. Well, sure, yeah, I'm hopeful. I think that things are getting better. I mean, p- look, man, as much of a cynic as I am, you just look at the world today compared to 50 years ago. Sure. I mean, how much better? How much better are things now? Seriously, like we have better life expectancy. We have mm. better drugs on the market. Porn is way better. Uh, we have. <laughs> we have. So wait, wait, hold on a second. Yeah. The, the, you're, you're talking about how positive and how much better the world is now than it was 50 years ago. Yeah. And the first three things you cited was <laughs> what life expectancy, uh-huh. porn and drug quality. Yeah. Keep, keep going. Keep going. <laughs> I want to see what's on the rest of this list. Thing, things are way better, buddy. Look, cars are more efficient. We, we, we're starting to get new rocket ships. That's cool, right? Mm-hmm. We can sure. fly to the moon. That's where I want to go. And um, uh, things are better with in terms of race relations. They're not perfect. We still have a lot of problems to overcome and a lot of issues, but things have gotten a lot better for a lot of people. Just look at the women's rights movement from the 1970s until now, gotten way better. Um, Not even, you know, we have a black president and it wasn't even one generation ago that that we had his father and his father's generation being sprayed with hoses and being segregated based on the color of their skin. That was 50 years ago. 
And look how much we've come just in that small amount of time. Look, there's still a lot of progress to be made, but I am hopeful and I do think that things are getting better. Uh, okay, so so in light of, of, of what you just said there, um, obviously you see progress being made and you think we're moving toward a brighter future, uh, you know, but obviously you bring up instances of idiocy and stupidity and just uh, the shortcomings of, of mankind consistently in your videos and, and your reviews. Uh, do you see this stupidity amassing into anything or down the road becoming a threat or is you know stupidity just always presence uh, bleh, is stupidity just always present somewhere in the history of mankind it's always just buzzing away in the background and all that really happens is over the course of time it just kind of changes flavors and and just changes uh, disguises and it just uh, i guess kind of takes a different tone or ideology well i guess i have to ask what you mean by stupidity do you mean people who are Ignorant or people who are just not intelligent? Uh, I guess ignorant, you know, uh, the, the, the types of things that would inspire you to, I don't know, make a video about, uh, I, I remember one video that, that was pretty successful for you uh, over the past year or so was that, uh, uh, that video about the uh, Spider-Man uh, comic cover. Yeah. The Spider Woman comic cover specifically. Correct. Um, the, 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 the type of uh, ignorance that would, inspire you to make that kind of video, you know, uh, uh, th that type of ignorance that obviously uh, creates a, an emotional rise in you that sort of demands you to get up and say something about it and do something about it. You know, wh when you see this very prevalent ignorance on a particular topic, does it worry you? Does it concern you? I mean, obviously it does. You make a video about it. But once you made a video about it, I mean, it's still kind of free to continue and persist. The idea, the bad idea. It's free sure, to persist. Sure, yeah. I guess. You know, is, is, is there a looming threat of bad ideas, in your opinion? So one of the most pervasive problems in, that I see today is the demonization of sex and sexuality. And specifically, I'm seeing it come from a lot of uh, women-centric websites like Bustle.com and Vox and uh, Mike.com. I guess not Vox, but Mike.com and, and Huffington Post for women, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they kind of, it's this idea that sex is bad. And if you are working in a sex, as a sex worker or in a sexual field, say as a pornographer or as a prostitute or as somebody who does, who gets nude on webcam or a stripper or male or female escorts, like that's somehow degrading or shameful. There is nothing wrong or shameful about sex and sexuality. If you are working in these fields by your own choice and you are doing this to earn, earn a, a, a good living, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, the, the problem is that when you start to demonize sex and sexuality, you, you get this, um, this weird phenomenon that occurs where people are afraid to have sex and they're afraid to be identified as someone who likes to have sex specifically with women, and you have this phenomenon of slut-shaming, right? You Have you heard of the expression slut-shaming? Sure, yeah. Yeah, slut-shaming is essentially where a woman likes to have sex or has had sex with lots of people, and she's, she gets called a slut, and she gets shamed for it, whereas uh, uh, that doesn't happen with a man. If we got rid of this concept of negativity with sex, that would, that would be eliminated, and it would also remove the pressure on, on people to lie about having had sexual relations with people um, and potentially even reduce the incidence of, of, uh, of rape, I think, uh, because if, if everybody chilled out a lot more about sex and sexuality, um, we wouldn't be so up, and up in arms about it, I believe. It's, it sort of perplexes me that, uh, that these hangups that we have in regards to sex still sort of uh, persist, especially now that religion doesn't seem to be playing as much a role in our lives as it used to as a, as a society. Um, maybe you disagree, you know, you can let me know. Uh, but now that it's not, uh, what's exactly keeping us from sort of moving past these hangups or are we still kind of dealing with, uh, the residue and sort of the, of, of this culture and kind of, uh, uh, uh we've still got 
the the traditions ingrained in us as a society, and maybe even though we're not going to church every day, uh, and we're not sort of you know preaching the teachings of the Bible, uh, we're still kind of uh, stuck on a lot of these uh, traditions and a lot of these points of view. Yeah, I think that a lot of these taboos came bar- came about. Uh, I think you hit on something important here, which is it is tradition. It is part of our culture. And it's going to take some time to undo that and reverse it. However, it's also steeped not just in religion, but also I believe that most of our p- taboos today that we have in our society come from, in the past, some, some sect of society had a problem, right? Uh, something they did or something they ate gave them a disease or made them sick. And... Uh, if you're not careful, you can get some diseases and you can get sick with promiscuity. So sexuality probably became demonized in part because of that. So there's probably still some, uh, some very rich hidden taboos that we have that we just kind of take for granted based on sex and sexuality because it's something that we didn't understand and it's something that made some people sick uh, and people still probably have that association, that attachment to it. But Getting rid of, getting back to the, uh, the the demonizing sexuality. Once we get rid of that, I think it will solve so many problems. There's just so many problems today that we can get rid of, um, and I, I don't know that society is moving in a positive direction in terms of sex and sexuality, specifically because we are living in a culture now where um, go look at women's magazines, man. Just look at women's magazines. There's no cleavage anymore. Uh, it's almost like. There's an unspoken message where if we show cleavage or anything that can be too provocative, it's a bad thing. So, um, or that it's degrading and shameful to the woman to be, to be nude, uh, and it's not. I think that, that we are sending the wrong message here. Uh, speaking of uh, big problems here, you know, we've talked about your YouTube channel. We've talked about uh, your website. Uh, tell us a little bit about your podcast uh, that you do every week, uh, The Biggest Problem in the Universe, uh, where you guys kind of are actively uh, trying to compile all of these problems and get people to vote on them. And uh, I'm trying to remember, uh, right now, number one is anti-vaxxers, I believe, on the list. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how long have you been doing this podcast and, and how close are you guys to finding The Biggest Problem in the Universe? Well, I've been doing the podcast for two years, just about two years now. It'll be two years in May. And uh, for anyone who hasn't heard it, uh, here's a brief introduction. It's basically a problem where, a show where we discuss problems every week, my co-host and I, and the listener votes on which problem is bigger so that over time we have a comprehensive list of every problem in the universe ranked from biggest to smallest. And uh, yeah, that's essentially the podcast in a nutshell. And how close am I to, to solving the biggest problem? I think I haven't brought it in yet. Personally, I think it's uh, it's asteroids, uh, hmm. which we totally take for granted that we are just living our lives and we don't have to worry about them. But man, that it just takes one to wipe out all of humanity. There is just one Apollo asteroid. And basically, Anthony, we don't know when the next one is going to hit us. We predict based on past uh, instances where asteroids have hit us once every 100,000 years or so. It's been about 700,000 years since the last really big asteroid hit Earth. Uh, so we're long overdue, and nobody's doing anything about it. Nobody's doing anything to prevent it. We are just sitting ducks. We're just basically sitting on this rock right now, hurling through space uh, on least time. Uh, and we don't know when it's going to be en- when it's going to end. Only thing we do know for sure is that it will happen. It is an in- inevitability. I saw this documentary with Bruce Willis where they blew up an asteroid that was going to hit Earth, and I don't see why they couldn't just do all that over again. Yeah, I saw that documentary, too. It was a good one. Uh, It was on PBS, I think. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Aerosmith did the soundtrack, too. Yeah, yeah. It was was, uh, Ken Burns, I believe, right? Is it Ken Burns' documentary? Um, Yes, yes. Yeah, it was was great. Um, Here's the thing, man. Look, uh, on some level... It's my gut hope that, that our government has some response to the asteroid, uh, the potential asteroid threat. But uh, I don't know in this political climate if we're even able to respond to that. Say, for example, U.S. Uh, researchers and scientists um, say that, hey, hey, Russia, we see this asteroid coming in, right? 
they notify Russia, they notify all of our allies, and they notify everyone. They say, hey, we see this asteroid coming in. We want to, we want to strike it down with nukes. And this is the, the best-case scenario, too, if we actually see it in enough time to respond to it. Well, who's to say that all these other com- countries are going to co- uh, cooperate and go along with it? Look at North Korea. They're scared shitless that we're going to launch a nuke, and they could just view this as a premise that we would use to bomb them. Right. So what if North Korea says you shoot a nuke up in the sky, we're going to shoot a nuke down the uh, to your west coast of, of California? Like what if what if that scenario could happen? We don't have time to react and worry about the politics of the situation. And we may be crippling ourselves by not cooperating. <sighs> yeah. Dude, you're giving, you're giving me nightmares, dude. Mm-hmm. Think about that. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Yeah. You guys tune into this podcast, not expecting such a deep convo, but you got it. <laughs> I, I I remember one uh, article in particular, uh, maybe last year that I had caught where um, NASA or maybe it was even uh, the Russians had spotted an asteroid that that was not going to hit Earth, but it was coming awfully close, and <laughs> they hadn't seen it until uh, a point where. I guess we wouldn't have even really been able to do anything about it if it had been on a trajectory with Earth. Correct. Yeah, these uh, these asteroids, um, we see most of them. Well, <laughs> I guess. I mean, you can't really know the, how many asteroids you don't see because you don't see them. Uh, but um, yeah, we see we see a good chunk of asteroids that come with uh, come within near near contact to Earth, and the ones that are in our path are called Apollo asteroids. Apollo asteroids are specifically ones that will cross our paths eventually. Uh, those are the ones we really have to worry about. And we know of a few of them. There's one that's scheduled to pass near Earth around 2036. But the problem with asteroids is that some of them are really dark um, in, in the, the literal sense of the word. They're just really dark. They're, they're made out of iron. And it's, we don't see a lot of light reflecting on them. Uh, so... There could be one coming towards us right now that we just don't see. All right. Um, I, I want to finish off this conversation talking about your upcoming book. It's going to be the third book that you've published, correct? Correct, yeah. Um, and you haven't really told a lot of people, uh, at least publicly, about this book. Uh, can you give us a bit of a preview as to what we can expect from it, when it's going to be out, and uh, you know wh- how you've been, what, what your process has sort of been working on it? Sure. I, so I haven't told anyone anything about this book, and I won't be giving away too many details, but I will say this. Um, when I wrote my first book, The Alphabet of Manliness, that was a really fun book to write, but it wasn't the book I wanted to write first. The first book I wanted to write is the book that I'm writing now. And the reason I'm able to write it now is because I have more clout and credibility, so I'm able to write the book that I really want to write now, uh, even though I really enjoyed Alphabet Manliness and so did a lot of fans, um, this is the book that I feel like is uh, really captures my voice. And it's all new material. It's all new stuff. It's something that uh, my fans haven't seen before. And I think it's uh, it's really going to resonate with a lot of people. It's really going to piss people off, I think. Hmm. Should people uh, sort of go into this book expecting the same sort of comedic tone that they've uh, read in your two previous efforts? Yes, to an extent. Uh, for example, my second book was I Am Better Than Your Kids um, yeah. or, or Crappy Children's Artwork. That was based on an article from my website. Mm-hmm. And The Alphabet of Manliness, to an extent, was also based on an article from my website um, called A Tribute to Manly Men or Real Men uh, that I wrote a long time ago. So in that sense, yes, it will be similar to the content and voice of my previous books in that those previous books were also similar in content and voice to my website. Hmm. Uh, is is this book inspired by a topic that you've uh, approached before, either in a video or in an article? No, I don't. Well, uh, to an extent, yeah, but uh, not really. It's, it's it's pretty new stuff. It's um it's stuff that if you read it, I think I think people who are familiar with my work, uh, if they read it without my name attached to it, they would know that it was written by me. It, it's, okay. It's it's a very much it's very much a Maddox book. So hmm. yeah. Okay, uh, so when are you planning on releasing some more details about the book and then hopefully releasing the book itself, if you can uh, talk about that? I'll release more details about the book, I believe, this June. Uh, this mm-hmm. June, I, I should have 
uh, it's, I should be ready to make an announcement around June. And then the actual book release is probably going to be next spring, uh, spring of 2017. It was going to be this fall, but the publisher decided to push it because everything in fall is going to be uh, crazy with the election and everyone's just going to be publishing elect uh, you know, book, political books, essentially. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right, then. I hey, wanted so to, uh, yeah. I have I have a question for you as okay. a, as a music critic. Can I pl- can I plug some uh, some music that I'm listening to? Or sure, not? do it, yeah. dude. All right, dude. A- actually, that that would be a that would be another good question to sort of end it out with. So yeah, you know, we'll we'll talk about like so if you want to talk music, and I didn't know you were down for that conversation. Oh, of course. You know, sure, plug some shit if you want to plug some shit, and then maybe we could talk some uh, favorite records or something. Sure, sure. Um, there's two things I just two two um albums that I'm listening to lately. There is a, a band I, I heard on XM, uh, XM satellite music. They have this metal, this metal station. Mm. And I know a lot of people don't listen to metal anymore because they're idiots. But you guys are making a mistake, and you should give it another chance. So um, it's a it's a uh, it's a Latin American metal band called Puya, P U Y A, and they have such a fresh sound. I I've never heard Mexican metal before, like Mexican thrash metal. And mm. it's a really cool sound. It's just, it's like you get those Latin rhythms in there. It almost sounds like a Latin folk song at one point. And then it busts into some heavy fucking metal that rocks your dick off. It's pretty mm-hmm. awesome. I highly recommend people check that out. Um, and then uh, the other album that I'm listening to is um, Luke Vibert. Uh, I don't know if you, you, uh, you know of Luke Vibert, but uh, uh, he is also known as Wagon Christ. And. He's worked with a bunch of different people, but there's an album he just came out with called Bizarster, and uh, that came out in October of last year. But it's a pretty cool. It's like down tempo, uh, down tempo trip hop, I guess is what you would call it. Okay, I've written both of those down, and uh, I'll throw some links in the description if uh, if anybody uh, uh, if if I can you know sort of come across these artists or at least write their names down in the description so people can search them up. Um, uh, going back to the whole metal thing, though, uh, yeah, I mean, metal is a chapter and it is a section that does turn up in your uh, Alphabet of Manliness book. Um, how long have you sort of been a metalhead? And I guess why is metal so central to you uh, when it comes to your personal life and just kind of being male? Yeah, I've been listening to metal since about high school. And I remember when I was a kid, I felt super lame because I couldn't relate to any of the music anyone else was listening to in my in my class. I remember going home one day after school and just combing through the radio, going station from station, starting from the bottom of the dial all the way to the top, trying to find the station that played the music that I liked. And I really didn't like anything I heard. Um, you know, here and there, there was a, so- a pop song that was OK. Like uh, I was a fan of Michael Jackson way back in the day. But that was about it. I was never really a big fan of pop. And then the first time I ever heard metal was um, when a skater kid brought it to school and he started cranking it. I'm like, what the hell is this? Why is it so angry? Why is it so awesome? And it made me feel alive. And by alive, I mean dead. Uh, It was Hmm. such a good feeling. You know, that was like the first time I really felt uh, dead inside. And that was like, yeah, I, I totally doubled down on metal. And I started finding heavier and heavier stuff. And the stuff that I find, I finally landed on that uh, spoke to me the most is Southern Thrash Metal, like Pantera. Uh, mm-hmm. And that was the band that spoke to me the most. Pantera and Sepultura, which is a Brazilian metal band. Yeah, Sepultura is great. Yeah. Um, Vulgar Display of Power was probably one of my favorite CDs in high school. Um, I actually just, I, I, I don't know where I put the CD. I mean, I lost it so long ago and I just saw it in a record store recently and I had to pick it up because that was just like something, a part of sort of my growing up. So I had to have it. It's so damn good. The, one of the first concerts I ever went to was Slayer and, uh, while the, while the band was setting up, they had an opening band. And they also had some music just playing through the PA system before the the, uh, the actual show started. And a, and I, everyone was kind of milling about and talking and waiting for the show to start. But when a Pantera song came on, the entire place went nuts. It was like they were playing live in the room. The play, this is like people started moshing and chanting along and singing. And it was like nothing. It was like no other metal band that that uh, that was played that day. 
uh, except for obviously the, the headlining Slayer. But uh, it was really badass. Uh, no yeah, other I mean, they're, they're, yeah. they're essentially a classic at this point, you know, yeah. I mean, they, they've made such a mark, um, especially during a time when uh, sort of simultaneously around that era. I mean, there was a lot of good metal music, but there was also that whole new metal thing going on, which uh, sort of ended up being like a bit of a cultural dead end because a lot of people just all of a sudden it seemed like overnight people just stopped taking new metal seriously and just sort of saw it as a joke. And it was it was kind of hard for uh, a lot of those good groups, Pantera being one of the few that actually, you know, were a great group and sort of, uh, and, and saw widespread popularity, uh, despite not being one of these trendier metal groups. Um, actually, a lot of those trendier groups are kind of ripping off a lot of their ideas. Um, so uh, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of great to have at least, you know, a metal band like that from back then uh, still sound so great in retrospect since, you know, a lot of people uh, look back on like a corn record uh, with a lot of disdain or a Slipknot record. Yeah, man. Um, when new metal came out and started becoming a thing, I think that's when a lot of people either got out of metal or got into this weird thing that it became. Uh, one of the newer metal bands that I, I finally came around to was, uh, and I, I begrudgingly say this, but Avenged Sevenfold. Um, I started listening to some of their stuff by accident because uh, it came on and I thought that uh, it sounded a lot like Metallica, like new Metallica stuff. Mm -hmm. And I looked at it and it, it sounded so much like Metallica. I'm like, this is actually kind of okay. I kind of dig it. And mm -hmm. it's funny because they're old fans, like their old new metal roots and their new fans are, I think, more people like me who like them because they're kind of biting on Metallica's style. But they do it really well. Hmm. Um, you know, as far as newer metal music, I mean, there was there was especially a lot of records last year that I thought were pretty good. Um, I know I know that you're talking about thrash metal, but I don't know. And, and also, you know, Pantera with the, the whole groove metal thing and alternative metal. Uh, I don't know if you're much into sludge or like grindcore or anything like that. I just recently started getting into hardcore. Uh, I don't know about uh, I, I've heard some some stuff that could be considered sludge, but I not not I'm not familiar enough to name any names except for the hardcore that I, I'm really into is uh, this band called Trapped Under Ice. Okay. Uh, Trapped Under Ice is a NorCal hardcore band, and it's like the broiest music I've ever heard. But I can't <laughs> I can't stop listening to it, and their fans are all really big bros but it's just really cool i just dig it there's a, a pretty awesome sort of bro bro-ish hardcore band um that i like a lot uh or at least i like one of their records a lot i'm trying to uh uh recall the name of the record so that i don't um uh mess up the title uh their name is shibalba and i believe they're from um they're they're from California as well, and it's like a bunch of Latino guys, and I think some of them might be from Mexico or yeah, they're from Los Angeles. Uh, uh, some of the songs are in Spanish, but they're all super fucking heavy, and they have this great record called Hasta la Muerte, and uh, it, the 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 album cover is amazing, and it features kind of this lone figure sort of standing in front of this I don't know giant pyramid with all these like epic towers sort of in the in the pyramid um so there's shibalba with like an x at the beginning they're good uh, a band called baroness came out with a record last year called purple or the purple album and uh they take a lot of um uh, inspiration from metallica too on that record there's a lot of really catchy songs on there some great riffs it's really heavy and thick a lot of bass um Another hardcore group that's really good, and hopefully they come out with a record this year. Uh, their name is Nails. They have a debut album called Unsilent Death that I think is about maybe like 16 or 17 minutes long in total. And it's amazingly fucking heavy and hard and in your face. Um, if you're looking for more hardcore and like metalcore, uh, a group from the East Coast, because hardcore was such a huge thing over here uh, in the 90s and the 2000s uh groups like converge are really great um hate breed is sort of a big group from connecticut yeah uh, i that, thought uh, that, hate, hate breed actually opened up for slayer at the first concert i ever went to okay yeah i yeah. mean dude like when i was in high school 
every hardcore band wanted to sound like hate breed from around here. Like yeah. you could pretty much go anywhere and see some local hardcore bands playing and everybody's just pretty much blatantly ripping off hate breed. Um, so, so yeah. And they, and they were pretty, you know, popular during their time. Um, also the band ghost. I mean, a lot of people think they're corny and they're a little over theatrical, but you know, if you're really into Sabbath and merciful fate and blue oyster cult, they have a new record out called Meliora that I think is really good. Um, I'm trying to think of a napalm death had a pretty decent record last yeah. year. And also, um, uh, a good sludge metal band called high on fire had a record come out last year. That was great called luminiferous. Oh man, this is, the, these are a lot of recommendations. I'm going to have to look, uh, look all these up afterwards. Shibalba Shibul- was the first one though, right? Yeah. Shibalba. Shibalba. Um, I'm going to look that up. And, uh, oh, and, and a thrash group that I just saw play live recently, and they told me that uh, uh, they have an album coming out soon. And I don't know if you've heard of these guys. They're really good, like a really good new thrash band. Their name is uh, Vector. Mm-hmm. No, I haven't heard. Uh, I think they're from New Mexico. The dude who <laughs> who fronts the group has this uh, amazing shriek that I, I think I've heard very few and far between singer, you know, v- very few singers sort of like hit the notes that he hits. And the guitar parts are great. The uh, drums are fantastic. The grooves and the, the the riffs are wild as hell. And a lot of the lyrics deal in uh, science fiction, which is sort of odd for a thrash group. Man, that sounds um, awesome. What's it called again? Uh, their name is Vector. V-E-K-T-O-R. Uh, they're they're really yeah. big. They're really big into bands like Voivod. Um, I believe they're actually kind of doing some tour dates with them. Um, so yeah, their name is Vector. They have a great album out called Black Future. Um, I actually was, when I when I actually caught them live, the lead singer had this really crude tattoo on his shoulder that said "Sci-Fi or Die," <laughs> <laughs> which you know, cons- considering the stuff that they sing about. I mean, they have a fucking song called "Asteroid." Um, yeah. <laughs> Big problem. <laughs> big, pro- big problem, buddy. Um, uh, you know, considering everything they sing about, you know, I wasn't really surprised to see that tattoo there. It was just kind of a hilarious confirmation. That's so, uh, so yeah, I mean, there's still a lot of great metal music coming out uh, that I think is really good. You know, the, the thing is, is that a lot of guitar music just isn't as relevant as it used to be, I guess. It's, it's sort of fallen to uh, the underground, you know, as far as mainstream music goes, guitar doesn't really have as much presence as it, as it used to. Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of a shame. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of guilty of listening to a lot of uh, synthetic stuff. And uh, I, l- I listen to a lot of um, chip tunes actually. Uh, Mm -hmm. because I love video games and I love video game music. Uh, If I could plug one other person right now, there's a guy, um, his name is Bert, Uh, Mm B-I-R-T. He's been a long-time scene dude who's done a lot of chiptunes, and now he's got a career making video game music. Um, He did the soundtrack to the new Contra game that came out on the the Nintendo DS, Contra Mm -hmm. 4, and he's done stuff for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and you've heard his music. But there's a track that I don't think is in any video game, but you can find it on YouTube. If you just go, uh, check YouTube, the, the name of the track is Staring at My Spaceship, and it's mm-hmm. by Vert, B-I-R-T. It's a really cool chiptune track. It's very uh, layered and complex compared to most of the chiptune you hear out there, but it's a really, really cool track. Um. Sorry, I just wrote that down. Yeah, um, and I'll throw that in the description box too. Cool. Uh, have you ever heard of, or do you uh, do you know of the group Anamanaguchi? Yeah, I'm a fan of their stuff. Yeah, I've uh, uh, I've talked with those guys quite a few times, and uh, you know, featured their stuff on the show a lot, uh, and have caught them uh, live as well, and they're really good live. Oh, very cool. Yeah, my buddy's uh, my buddy Roger Barr from uh, the website I Mockery is, fan- is a friend with a friend of theirs. And he's seen them live a few times. I, their stuff is always on my playlist. Awesome. Awesome. That's yeah. great. Um, okay, then. Well, that's great. Great music conversation that I did not expect to have. Yeah, man. Nice capper. This. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay, man. We will provide links to all of your stuff down there in the description box. Again, I want to thank you for coming on the show and sort of giving us some insight into what you're doing and, uh, you know, sort of, uh, dropping the, dropping the tough guy fucking attitude to come on here and just, just be, just be the nice guy that you are underneath, obviously. Oh, thanks man. But that's, that's absolutely slander. I will sue you. 
I will sue well, you for calling me nice. <laughs> well, have your lawyer send me an email, and then I will uh, politely uh, disregard it. Yeah, just, uh, that, with, that with sounds a response. Fair. That's that's yeah. uh, that sounds fair in all due respect. And Anthony, uh, keep up the great work yourself, man. I know that. Uh, uh, you have your your loyal fan base and everything, but your reviews are really on point. Uh, you have you do it you do it well, and there's a reason that you have a following. I've checked out your stuff. You I, as I told you before this uh, this call started uh, when you I, I'd seen your videos before, and when you messaged me on Twitter, you were like, "Hey, you want to do uh, an interview?" And I didn't recognize that it was you based on the the uh, picture that you had because it was a little uh, caricature. And then I clicked on, I'm like, "Oh yeah, of course, yeah, I've seen your channel before." So, oh, cool. uh, yeah, Thanks, keep man. up the great work. Yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs>